Okay, I'll just quickly run through some numbers, uh, seeing we got cut off, so I've, I've have, to, have to deliver for you. Okay, um, our current modelling on Plantation Manuka, we're working on establishment costs of probably two thousand, oh, approximately $2,000 per hectare, but that varies quite a bit according to the state of the land, like if it's, uh, if it's partly revered, it's got gorse on it, that sort of thing, um, the establishment cost might be a little bit higher. Um, if it's clean pasture but steep land, you could probably do it for underneath that, less than that. We're working on planting density and, and, and we will continue to trial that, but basically three by three metre spacing, so that works out of 1,100 stems to the hectare. Our modelling is based on a 25 year productive life, so we're saying we're establishing basically first tier forestry as manuka, but over time you'll get new species coming through, um, and you might want to encourage that as part of your planting programme. Um, and we're looking at a floral maturity after planting of about six years. So. Um, just looking there, um, two years, nothing. With, with, with our oldest plantation, we're getting some floral in about that zone and sort of jumping to 40%, 80% canopy and 100% after six or seven years. So that's just sort of the growth rates we're looking at. But obviously vary according to site um, and uh, the, um, how well you've established it. Just looking at some current modelling and looking at um, some key variables around apiary. So if you're looking at a natural manuka stand, uh, the beekeepers here will tell me it's highly variable between season. We've probably done better this season than, uh, than in the previous last two years. But we're working on stocking rates of roughly at one hive to the hectare. Um, an average in some of the better producing areas is about 30 kgs per hive. And um, average sort of five plus um, UMF honey around about the $13, uh, $15 a, a kilo. Um, that's without ageing it. Um, which provides a revenue of about $400 per hive or per hectare at a one hive per hectare stocking rate. Now I should say that, um, and the beekeepers are amongst us here, that I know a lot of people think these beekeepers are making a killing, but it's the, there are real costs in running a, an apiary business, and you're sort of looking at um, operating costs of around $250 to $300 a hive, um, so the margins aren't that good, and she's tough work, and that's... Uh, there's a bit of variance in what you might take out for management drawings in there. Uh, current deals with landowners, roughly around 10% revenue share with landowners, and that varies according to the market in certain regions, which would provide a $41 per hectare um, income for the landowner on reverted manuka. So that's, uh, that's sort of what's going on around there, and there's a lot of variation around that. Plantation manuka, what are we looking at? So this is a bit of guesswork, but we're saying that um, we, uh, the numbers I put up here are based on one hive to the hectare. We may be able to lift stocking rates, but um, hives for me, from a, as a sheep, of, from a sheep and beef farming background, they're a bit different from a cattle beast. That you can put more honey boxes on hives, and what we're really focused in Kiwi Bee anyway is, is maximising production per hive. So I sort of left the numbers at one hive per hectare, but it could be higher than that. But varying the uh, production per hive, and this is just guesswork. But we're assuming with the, with the superior nectar flows from these new cultivars, we should get higher uh, yields per hive. So working on a range between 40 and 60 kg, kgs per hive. Bearing in mind this is average over, say, a five-year period. I know the other thing that I've learned uh, coming into the apiary sector is the variability from season to season. You know, um, you normally get an even flow with sheep and beef, but in apiary it, it is a real jigsaw. Um, or, or a sawtooth variant. So um, you're looking at quite a ra wide range in variance between season, but looking at averages in there between 40 and 60. Um, and then w this is when your Jonathan showed you that graph with the, uh, with the red line. And if you can get, uh, this is where the numbers could be significantly greater in value per kilo because you're getting more purity of honey out of a um, uh, plantation plus you're getting high UMF. And the other thing that we haven't talked about is perhaps changes in the way um, manuka honey is, is going to be classified and the characteristics around that. And that could make significant, reduce significantly the amount of manuka honey that's actually available. There's a lot of man blended honey that's sold as manuka honey. That could change in the future. But anyway, that's another story. But you're looking at a range of apiary revenue significantly higher than natural manuka. The other thing I'll put in here is that the landowner, and if I was a landowner, I'd be wanting a higher revenue share.
because you're investing in two grand a hectare and planting this plantation manuka, and I think the numbers are good enough from the beekeeper's point of view to justify paying up to 30% to the landowner. That's revenue share. If you look at profit margins and sharing profit out of apiary, that's probably a 50-50 profit share. Um, so the income to the landowner is, is a significantly higher, 180 to $360 per hectare. And if you're doing an internal rate of return analysis, so this is on a marginal basis, so this is not costing in the existing value of the land, you're looking at between 6.7 and up to 15%. We're actually working, numbers talking to landowners, we're working in that zone there, because we just don't know at this stage. Um, just uh, from what Nick's been talking about, here's a real life example of a total farm. I played around with the numbers, but this is from the Bay of Plenty. So this is a total farm, 1,000 hectares. Um, if you split out that class three hard hill country out of that farm, and it did, this is a real life example with a farmer, he figured out he's making a loss on his 100 hectares of uh, $95 a hectare. Exactly what Nick was saying. He, he was actually better off retiring that chunk of land and farming his residual, and in fact that's what he's done and he's making more money. So and he's actually be able to farming his residual um, better. But what I, the point I'm trying to make here is um, people have often said to me, why did you cost in the value of the land? I'm like Bruce, I'm from a valuation and farm management background, in fact we used to work to the Rural Bank together and lend out land development and encouragement loans in the old days, didn't we Bruce? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to admit it, do we? <laughs> but um, what the point I wanted to make here from a valuation point of view, um, that 100 hectares is, um, from a, in a productive value point of view, is worthless. So it's not worth costing it in. So I, I tend to look at it on a marginal costing basis and do a drill down, look at the land use capability on the various areas we're looking at in, in, those, in those farms, um, which is what Nick was talking about. So if you're actually looking uh, at a rough comparison at this stage, um, the, the, the past, under the pastoral use, this marginal class three hill country is actually making nothing. In fact, it's probably making a loss. Plantation manuka, you could be looking at a, at a, um, at a 6.7 or 15% return, which is a, on a marginal basis. Um, just the other thing is this capital outlay, obviously, in the pastoral use with stock, carrying about 400 stock units, um, or four stock units to the hectare, rather, and you'd be outlaying 200. So that's probably where it starts hurting farmers who are strapped for cash at the moment finding that two grand a hectare to retire that land. So you start talking around proving the concept and attracting investment to do that, much as, in, as we have done with forestry. So that's probably where we are at the, are at the moment, but I said it's work in progress and be pleased to report to you more live data as we go, go forward. So uh, thanks for that. For the scientists in the room, um I'm a living example of, of adaptation to environment. I used to manage a big forestry, um, forestry uh, plantation in the centre of North Island, um, and I bowled a lot of manuka, I must admit, to, um, to make way for trees, and now I'm back planting manuka. So uh, it's it, it, adaptation to economic environment, you might say. Um, this is one example of, of uh, our efforts into, in learning about uh, the establishment, the economics of it, and uh, the general silver culture. And we're doing this very much in a joint venture with the Hawke's Bay Regional Council on their forest park. And, and you've got both Steve Cave and Blue McMillan in the audience, and they're much more familiar with this area than I am. Uh, and they're very much part of this what is a very large experiment. We're planting essentially all that hillside along there, about 140 odd hectares, isn't it, Steve? Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a tough environment up on the top. It's blue as the farmer on this property will attest. You know, you're up at about 500 metres. That's the west over there, and uh, I um, don't need to actually spend much time up there to have very roomy eyes from the wind roaring in. So, um, it's, it's, it's going to be a very good litmus test for, for the species. And it goes right down to, toward the lake. This was a, a little trial area where we were testing uh, rates of chemicals um, and whether or not we really needed to go to a sort of forestry type and, and uh, plantation effort. Um, these are some of the results after a couple of years. Um, we had a dream year when we planted and we planted late and we got very high survivals, but we're 
cognizant of the fact that it wasn't a typical Hawke's Bay summer. Uh, we've just had a typical Hawke's Bay summer and the trees um, continued growing and on our recent, more recent plantings did quite well in terms of survival. Some of that drop of 15% in the bad summer is due to hares and goats as much as the drought. Um, one of the um, provenances that we have in there, virtually 100% flowering after one year, so it's looking quite promisingly precocious at this stage. John. Uh, we're on to John, are we? Yeah. Yep. So that's essentially where we're at to date. Um, and we have a number of sites around, around the country. Uh, so in 213, for instance, we're doing about 10 sites and about 350 hectares.